four years ago, I died on the carnivore diet. My whole body hit the ground. Doctor tells my wife, here's the deal. He's not gonna wake up tomorrow. I didn't know who to believe or who to trust anymore. And I think that's a very common concern among people. If you don't know people, your doctor's supposed to be healing you. My doctor said, if you don't immobilize your foot, you won't walk for a year. I literally rode in a wheelchair for almost six months. Bloody Mary's in the morning by nine or 10 o'clock. Michelob Ultra's in the pool of one, drinking vodka and diet Sprite, because diet drinks are better for you. I gained a superfluous amount of weight. Next thing you know, I was up to 256 pounds. Sir, she doesn't want to see that big gut anymore. She wants to be proud of you and she's probably not. I don't want to hear the excuses anymore. And I could feel my heart. I mean, you know how you get scared and your heart beats? I could feel it in my chest. I'm surprised I didn't have a heart attack right then. Now I look back and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I was killing myself. Greg, you've got an RV behind you that is painted like the different cuts of a cow. How did we get to this point? For those who don't know you, could you please give some background on your story and how you got to where you are today with your meat mobile? <laughs> Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Greg McNair and let me go way back in time. Standard American, standard Western diet, ate it all, didn't exercise, didn't like exercise, don't like the feeling. I wasn't overly athletic. I liked girls, motorcycles, and airplanes and helicopters. So uh, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for being quite healthy. Leading up to 2013, I was 250 to 260 pounds. There were probably times that I was bumping 270, wearing 3X t-shirts, wearing size 46 pants. I was in five foot nine. I was extremely out of shape. And I, well, I take that back. I wasn't out of shape. I was a shape. And I didn't like that anymore. So 2017, I met my wife and Lorley has an, a younger brother born with Cushing's disease. And Nutrition plays a huge part in everything in someone's life, no matter if they're 10 fingers, 10 toes and no problems or full of birth defects. Nutrition is still vitally important. And he had always been on keto. And my mother-in-law, Alicia, said, you know what? We're going to try this thing called horn carnivore. I've been researching it. I've been seeing these people like Dr. Saladino, Dr. Barry, Dr. Baker, Dr. Boz. She had been paying attention to all that. And she said, I'm going to try it for Richie as well. And it worked. Then she did it. And I actually have a before and after photo of her that when I show people those photos, they're so beside themselves to see it. And then I throw the curveball. Tell me how long that took. And they said, I don't know, a couple of years. I said, three months. And the look of shock that washes over somebody's face, I say, listen, you have to understand it's not what you eat. It's what you don't eat. And when you eliminate the things that you know your body's not supposed to digest or can't digest, or it's not supposed to have in it, that only leaves a very few things. So she did it, and I had injured my gastric muscle, which my doctor said, if you don't immobilize your foot, you're going to snap that. And you think an Achilles heel hurts? You've seen nothing yet. You won't walk for a year. I said, okay. So they wrapped my leg. I literally rode in a wheelchair for almost six months. And during that time, I had gained a lot of weight. And I think about 30 or 40 pounds. And I went to my mother-in-law and said, tell me about this carnival life. She told me, I said, what do I do? She helped me get into it. And it was really simple. Eat beef. That was it. I still drank my coffee and um, I started losing weight like it was nobody's business. And the next thing you know, I had energy to spare. My leg was healing. I felt like I could get out and run again. I could do things again. It was a full lifestyle of carnivore for almost three months solid where I mean, I'd literally walk into Outback Steakhouse and I would buy a steak and uh, maybe a grass-fed burger patty. And that was it. So I was that hardcore. And very long story short, I suffered through the stroke that should have killed everybody. Usually it kills everybody at the age of 70 or 80 because that's typically where you have that stroke. And um, my doctor even said they'd never met a survivor because the person was always unconscious. and. Um, the longest he's ever seen somebody survive was 24 hours, 23 hours that was spent by the family fighting over who was going to unplug me from the wall. Wow. So, and you know, I've heard your story before, but just to clarify for those who haven't, you basically heard about carnivore years ago through your mother. And so you tried it 
and you only ate carnivore for three months and then you had this stroke. And so then inevitably the question is, do you think that the carnivore diet then contributed to the stroke in any way? Good question. So I died four years ago and I was on the carnivore diet. I, I did not die because of the carnivore diet. I died because I had taken methylprednisolone, a oral steroid for what we thought was a cold leading up to a mission trip that I was going on Hurricane Dorian survivors in the Bahamas. I had a cold. My doctor said, take the steroid. I said, no, I don't like steroids. Doctor said, then you're not going on the mission trip. Well, I wanted to go on the mission trip, so I took the steroid. 15 hours later, my head was on the ground. My face was, my whole body hit the ground. And laying in the hospital bed, doctor tells my wife, um, here's the deal. He's not going to wake up tomorrow. And so we're going to break protocol and let you sleep in the bed with him tonight. And they made it so that she could sleep right next to me in this little bitty twin bed. And I woke up. There was a mirror over my face where I was fogging it. She was laying her head on my chest, looking up at the mirror the whole time. And she said, hi, good morning, honey. I said, hi. She said, doctors want to talk to you. I said, okay. Doctors, she stepped aside. Four doctors at my feet, basically giving me a hard time for being a carnivore. And uh, they said, what do you know about a stroke? I said, nothing, except you said I had one. They said, well, okay, so there's a stroke in America every four minutes, and one in four of those is fatal. So every 16 minutes, somebody dies of the stroke that you had. I said, oh, okay, well, here I am. And one of them was a very skeptical doctor, eyebrow way up here. And they said, we're trying to figure out why you're still alive. And I said, mm, God, and I'm a carnivore. And he said, what do you mean you're a carnivore? And I said, I don't eat plants. I'm plant-free. And he said, that's impossible. So I thought you just told me I survived the impossible stroke. You're the one laying in the bed, not me. He actually said that. And um, that was pretty unfair. Now, I understand practicing Hindus are vegetarians. I get it. They worship the thing that's on the side of my RV. I worship it too, but I eat it. That's the way I worship it. I think God gave us the best nutrition in the world. He didn't like that answer. And subsequently, he was fired by me because you can fire your doctor. If you don't know it, people, your doctor is supposed to be healing you. I didn't know who to believe or who to trust anymore. And I think that's a very common concern among people. I had that stroke. I was convinced it was because I was a carnivore. I was convinced I had done something wrong to my body. But the weird thing is, two weeks prior to that, Lily, I had gone to Lifeline screening where you can pay a small amount, cash out of pocket, and they do testing for you, all kinds of tests. And they did a CAC score which is the calcium score of my veins, of my arteries. And they did my carotid. They did my, um, oh gosh, I can't remember all the all the things. People watching this will know. Anyways, they did all this test. And the doctor came out a week later with my results. And they said, call us. So I did this. said, you have the veins of a newborn baby. How is that possible? And I explained that I don't eat garbage. And my A1C, I think, was 5.4 very healthy. And then I had the stroke and somewhere along the way, enough calcium was kicked out of my vein that went into my brainstem that technically speaking, I should have been dead. Like the doctor said before my body hit the floor. That's because there's no more blood going to your brain. There was nothing going to my brain. My blood sugar was 229 that morning. Prior to that, leading up to that for a solid month, my average blood sugar was 74 for a month. So I know what my blood sugar was. I know when it was high and I knew it was low. I could feel it. That day it was 229. And my doctor told me, my holistic doctor, she's been a carnivore for, I'm going to say 32 years now. She said, Greg, you could have eaten a three-chaired wedding cake by yourself the night before and not seen a 229 blood, blood sugar. That was because when I took the steroid, it pushed all the leftover glucose out of my liver and into my system. And boom, I had this choke. So... The super, super long story short is we got married in the chapel, in the hospital, at Advent Hospital, three days after the stroke. Um, my mother passed away three months later from cancer. She had metastatic breast cancer. When she passed away, I fell down the carb hole, and I went from being super healthy. Matthew McConaughey couldn't hold a candle to me. I feel like I was kind of getting close towards Dr. Saladino and, and Dr. Chafee and their bodies. Because I do have a man crush on both those guys. I hate to admit it, but it's true. I want their physique. 
while I was recovering from this, I started gaining weight because I went back to eating carbs. In fact, after my mom passed, I started drinking again. And I was drinking a substantial amount with my stepfather. Next thing you know, I was up to 256 pounds and or 254, one of the two. Anyways, it, it was bad. Uh, my wife and I moved into an RV, sold the house, traveled the country, explored, loved life. And it became an exercise in day drinking, to be honest with you, Lily. Bloody Mary's in the morning by 9 or 10 o'clock. Michelob Ultra's in the pool at 1. And drinking vodka and Diet Sprite, because diet drinks are better for you, at 5 or 6 o'clock. And then I was eating hamburgers, hot dogs, pizza, whatever the heck I wanted. And I fell down the carpool again. And, um, and it was really unhealthy for me. So I gained a super perfilous amount of weight. Is that the right word to use? And uh, August of 2022, my wife and I were at, uh, and her name is Laura Lee, by the way, we were at the Low Carb Keto Summit, and I finally got to meet Ken Berry. We were talking, and I told him I have this crazy idea to do this to the RV, and he says, well, Greg, that sounds really cool. Let me know if you ever do. Well, I went home that night, and I sat behind my computer, and uh, about $10,000 later, this is what you get. You get the cut of a cow. That's exactly right. So there's Brisket in all of his glory. <laughs> and I told my wife, um, look, I'm retired. You're not. I can't just come back and get back into a house. I, I don't want to get back into a house. I'm going to stay in this. I'm going to travel. And Brisket has since become my accountability partner. So... August, I started doing August of 2022. I got back into carnivore, hit it full head on nuts to the wall. And here I am uh, still doing it and realized that I cannot step out of that door right there, weighing 256 pounds without somebody going, oh, yeah, no wonder you're so big. Um, forget your cholesterol, you're fat. So brisket is my accountability partner. As much as I want to eat carbs sometimes, um, I don't. And in March of 23, I gave up alcohol. And I am so much better for it, Lily. I can't even explain. Wife asked me last night, do you miss alcohol? And I said, yeah, I miss the flavor, but I don't miss the way I lost control of myself. And losing control can be just a minor buzz to uh, blackout drunk. And I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to be in control of my body. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, there's many things in life that we can't control, but one of the things that we can control is what we put into our bodies. And if there's something that you know when you eat it, it doesn't serve you, well then, then I wouldn't have it. <laughs> Easier said than done though. And maybe we can talk more about that, but I'm just curious, you know, a lot of people think a carnivore diet is dangerous and that you're going to clog your arteries, have a heart attack. I mean, you did have a stroke, though it sounds like you think the stroke has more to do with the steroid than eating carnivore. And I also would agree. I don't think that eating meat for three months would lead up to the severity of a stroke. I think usually for a stroke to happen, it's years and decades of doing the wrong thing. So I guess the question is, do you regret eating carnivore? Not a bit. Um, the thing I did the most wrong in my life happened in 2018. I started juicing. Oh my God, Lily. I had mixed beets and celery and carrots. When I drank that, and I was going to go for a run, I drank that. I had more jet fuel in my system to run. But what I had basically just done was consumed the equivalent of almost 10 Coca Colas <laughs> in one drink. And it was just pure sugar. And I could feel my heart. I mean, you know, you know how you get scared in your heart beats. Mm -hmm. I could feel it in my chest. I'm surprised I didn't have a heart attack right then. And I don't think people understand how much sugar they're getting out of a juiced drink. And I don't care what vegetable they put in it. So that was a really bad time in my life. And I didn't know I was hurting myself. Who knows? Maybe that led to it. So add that to a list of my regrets, right? Trying juicing for, for as long as I did. And I got so many people doing it with me and we were all having such a great time. And now I look back and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I was killing myself with juice. It is what it is. 
According to the USDA, less than 2% of Americans get enough potassium in their diets, meaning 98% of us may be deficient in potassium. And potassium is critical for heart, muscle, and nerve function. Someone deficient in potassium may experience increased blood pressure, irregular heartbeats, fatigue, cramping, and constipation. One way that I get more potassium in my diet is through a drink mix called Element, which not only provides me more potassium, but also sodium and magnesium without any sugar, artificial food colorings, or nasty ingredients in it. I'll add the orange flavored packet into my milk to give me kind of a dreamsicle drink, or I'll have the raspberry and watermelon in my water throughout the day, which keeps me hydrated. You can get eight free packets of all of Element's different flavors with any order by going to the link in the description. And Element does have a money back guarantee. So if you don't enjoy it, you can get your money back without any hassle. But again, you can get those eight free packets of Element by going to the link in the description or the URL drinkelement.com slash Lily Kane. You mentioned brisket, which I'm assuming is the RV's name. Yes, that's brisket. Okay. So you mentioned brisket is your accountability buddy. And for me, when I first started moving into having less processed foods and less sugar, my accountability buddy was my husband. Now, at this point, I haven't had any processed junk foods in over three and a half years. And the longer you continue to do something, the more it becomes a habit and second nature. And so I don't need an accountability buddy. It's like I can go to the grocery store. I can look at the chips and all the donuts and whatnot. And I have no interest in them whatsoever. Though when someone's first trying to make steps to becoming healthier, sometimes it can feel isolating or lonely. Oftentimes the people around you aren't eating the same way. And so for you, you had brisket and I had my spouse. What would be the advice you would give to somebody who doesn't have an accountability buddy and who does feel more lonely? Wow. What a good question. Um, my heart goes out to those who are, who are married, who do have a significant other who does not agree with their lifestyle. I know what the biggest challenge is for that. So let me speak to those people first. Cook for yourself. I don't care if you're the man of the house, the woman of the house, cook for yourself. Behind every marriage, you still have a husband and a wife. You still have individual people. And you cannot lose sight of who you are to be somebody for somebody else. Be that person for you. When you do that, then they're going to go, I think they're onto something because they can see the change. They see the energy. I like to tell people being a carnivore, being a low carb, being a ketovore, call it what you want. Being that way is a lifestyle. It's not a diet. If you approach this from a diet standpoint, and when I say diet, that's the worst word in the world. It's a cuss word because it means you have to give something up. Think of this lifestyle as getting to gain everything. You're not limiting yourself to life when you eat this way. You are opening yourself to life. The weight loss, it's just along for the ride. The very first thing you're doing is you're healing yourself from the inside out, things that people can't see. They can't see your brain, but they see the results of what's going on in your brain. You know a depressed person, they're typically overweight. There's a reason why people go down that path, and it all starts with nutrition. And if they, if they take care of their bodies first, then they can help others, starting with themselves. So to that person who's responsible for cooking for your family, cook for yourself and tell your family, if you want to eat something, there's the fridge, there's the pantry, you do you, boo, because I'm going to do me. And eventually, they're either going to starve or they're going to start eating what you make. Don't go down the, the, the line of, well, I'm going to cook for me and then I'll cook something for you guys. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. They're going to have to learn. They're going to have to figure it out. It's called tough love and it's called sacrifice to every person watching this. If you're that person who has that spouse over here that's sitting on the shoulder saying that's bad for you or you shouldn't do that, show them this video and let them hear what I'm about to say. Back off. You loved this person. You do love this person. Show them how much you love them by respecting them. And respecting them means if they're going to eat this way and you're not, that's your problem, not theirs. Don't expect somebody to come in and live for you. They're living for themselves first. And then when they are the best they can be, 
they will then be the best for you. And then eventually you might figure it out and you'll start being the best for yourself and then the best for them. At 53, I know a lot of people. I've met a lot of friends and I've seen an awful lot of relationships go south because the woman let go of herself. She was drinking a glass of wine every night, turned into a half a bottle, turned into a full bottle. He started drinking a beer, turned into three beers, turned into, and eh, maybe I'll have some vodka. And before you know it, this couple that has this fantastic picture of them when they were 23 years old, getting married, healthy, skinny, started getting fatter and fatter and less attractive to each other. And as they got less attractive, one or both partners started looking the other direction. More often than not, it's because you're looking at somebody else because you're missing something in your life. Well, take care of you first. I know this happens more for women than it does for men. A couple gets divorced, and then the woman starts showing up at the gym, starts taking care of herself, and sh her answer to the world is, I'll show that SOB. I'm going to become the best thing I ever could be. Well, honey, you owe it to him now. Be that way now, because he married you because he loves you. Sir, she doesn't want to see that big gut anymore. She wants to be proud of you, and she's probably not. I'm going to get preachy about that because you know what? I don't want to hear the excuses anymore. I see so many people come out of their RVs and they're waddling. And they don't get to do the stuff that you and I get to do, which is go on hikes, go through mountains. I mean, I went on a two-mile hike the other day, and nobody there knew that I had just had a stroke four years ago where I couldn't even think about that. And here I am doing it. So I don't think anybody's got an excuse. There's a way. You just got to make it. But to those who they don't have an accountability partner, you know what? They do have an accountability partner. They have you. They have me. They have people in the network. Those accountability partners exist out here. The thing that stops people is they don't ask. They simply don't ask. And they should. Go into a comment. Don't be embarrassed. Go into a comment part of a, of a video like this and say, hey, guys, look. I've got nothing to, nothing to lose here, everything to gain. Help me. I want to be a part of this some way, somehow. Let me talk mm -hmm. to you. Keep me accountable. Find that accountability partner through your friendships. And your friendships can be all the way around the world. You can make friends with uh, doctors in Europe. Uh, they're everywhere. Every, anybody that's got a signal. I have, look for the... I have made so many friends, actually, through social media. And I think people would be surprised how there are so many people out there who are also looking for people to talk to and to bounce ideas off of. And so, yeah, there's absolutely people out there. Though I'd argue one of the potential downfalls to having access to so many people is then you're also exposed to so many opinions. Avoid dairy. Eat fruit. Never touch a cracker ever again. I guess, where do you stand on your personal diet? And also, I guess for other people too, do you think that people have to be strict or they can be more flexible. You know your limits. And if you can't have just a little because you know it's going to lead to more, then don't do it at all. How much alcohol is safe for an alcoholic to drink? A Michelob Ultra? A little... That's the answer we're looking for. Zero. 100% of nothing. My sister-in-law got married. And at her wedding, I had sparkling water. Everybody else was drinking champagne. I walked up to the bar, and instead of having any drinks at all, I walked up to the bar and I said, can you please do me a favor and take this champagne back and give me back club soda with lime in it? They said, oh, yeah, sure. So there's always a way. But to the people who still slip every now and then, I think it was a big deal that you opened up your refrigerator for people to see, because if I open my fridge right now, you would see things in there that everybody's going to jump up and down about. Oh, my God, you should be eating that. Frank's Red Hot. I got the same stuff inside my place, but what I don't have is the popcorn that I used to put the red hot sauce on. If you've never tried it, don't, because you'll be hooked and you go back to eating corn. <laughs> um, it's okay to color outside the lines that everybody does. Nobody's a perfectionist, or nobody is perfect except Jesus. So here it is. If you feel like you're going to eat a club cracker, eat a club cracker. Get that feeling out of your body. And if it turns into more than two, you probably should just get rid of them out of your entry altogether. 
if you feel the need to wash your hair with Prell because you miss that smell, wash your hair with Prell. You won't die from it. If you go down a little bit of the carb hole or you fall into the carb river, you're going to float down the river. So just don't. My wife asked, Greg, do you want to have a glass of wine one night? Nope. Because I know if I have a glass, eventually it might turn into a glass every other night because, well, I did it the other night and I didn't feel so bad. I don't want it. I, I don't, I don't need it. Right. And you know your limits. And I actually watched a video of yours this morning and you were talking about how nowadays when you are walking around your neighborhood or the grocery store, people just look so tired. And I'm wondering if you think it's because of what they're putting in their bodies, their nutrition, or if you think it's more because of societal pressure, the, we kind of live in a go, go, go hustle, bustle, more, more, more kind of society. And so maybe that's why people are feeling more exhausted. I guess, why do you think people are looking so much more tired nowadays? I, I think people are depressed. I think there is such a rise in depression and anxiety and a rise in mental instability that we get tired because our body is fighting. And when our body is fighting, eventually it gives up. I think the fatigue comes from our bodies trying so hard to process garbage. And especially if you're a drinker, please hear me when I tell you this. Please, please, please. You're not drinking because it tastes good. Don't lie to yourself anymore. You're drinking to escape something. And that buzz is what people chase. And if you stop chasing that buzz, you start to feel better. When you get that out of your life and you're not craving it, the bacteria in your gut biome that was craving it is gone. Mm -hmm. Once you're at that point, you have an awakening inside your body that you didn't know was there. I think the fatigue that we see around here is people who drink. I really think that's where it comes from because the drinking leads to bad decisions about the food you eat. And, you know, everybody jokes about Waffle House. Uh, you know, it's the best place to go at 2 a.m. when you're drunk and everything's a picture menu. So you just point at it and go, yes. Well, the food at Waffle House is actually good for you. You can stick to the eggs and the bacon and the sausage and don't eat anything else. But when you're drunk, you have this taste for sugar. When you're drunk, you have this taste for comfort food mm -hmm. and you don't realize it. And when you do that, you're killing yourself. So your body already can't process the alcohol very well. It's certainly not processing the food because it's so busy trying to fight that alcohol out of your system. And then your body just finally gives up. And number three is your <laughs> comatose in your bed. Time out for just a moment. I'm going to do this exercise because I love doing this. That truck, that is a diesel Ford F-350. That runs on only diesel. What happens if you put gasoline in my truck? It's not going to work. The only time things are different is when the engine is different. But let me tell you something. My engine is the exact same thing as your engine. It may be able to handle certain things, but that doesn't mean it's good for it. Your diesel engine does not burn gasoline. Your gasoline engine does not burn diesel. So why are you putting garbage in your system? Put the right fuel in your system to begin with. You might get a sugar buzz from eating a donut. Uh, what is it? My friend sent me a photo the other day. Three tablespoons of Heinz ketchup contains more sugar than a Krispy Kreme glazed donut. So I think the fatigue that I see people walking around has a whole lot more to do with their nutrition than it does with their, with their stressors in life. When you eat properly, you will find out that you can handle just about any stress that comes your way. Mm -hmm. And people wonder, well, I hate going to the gym. Well, I hated going to the gym too until I realized, wait a minute, that Dr. Anthony Chafee I talked about that has that body I'd kill for, I can have that too. And it's not hard to get because I've got the energy. And the reason why I've got the energy is because I eat the right foods and I don't have to sleep 12 hours. And when I don't have to sleep 12 hours and I've got energy and how do I get rid of this energy? I'm going to the gym. That's what people do you find out that it's something that you end up liking and you start seeing the results from it. And this morning of all mornings and for this conversation to happen, my trainer is working me out and we're doing something that is killing me. I mean, I'm breaking out a hard sweat. I'm like, Ooh, 
I'm making all these grunts and noises. He looked at my back and he said, dude, you should see your lats right now. And he could see him through my shirt. I said, are, are they strong? He said, dude, I wish you could see the changes that I've seen in the last month since you've been here. And at some point, it's not a sacrifice that hurts. At some point, it's a sacrifice that uh, be, it hurt initially, but it became an easy to win thing. You see a six pack of abs. I'm going for the eight pack next. You see uh, traps up here. You want to put an inch taller traps on your neck, whatever it may be. You, you get there because you've already started. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well, you know, you get to see a little bit of your stomach going down. And then the next thing you know, you got abs. And you're like, Oh my God, I've got abs. This is great. And now you start filling out the rest of your body because it just comes naturally. Once you start the ball rolling, the rest of it comes easy. But going back to this is not a diet. This is a lifestyle. All the good things that come your way, come your way because you started ingesting the right food to begin with. Just the way it works. Okay. So Greg, if you have friends who come to you and they're like, that all sounds great. I want to start eating healthier, but I can't give up a certain food or I, there's no way I'm going full blown carnivore. Like I have friends who they would never just only eat meat nor do I think that people have to only eat meat to be healthy or to lose weight. But if I did say to family or friends, you got to go hardcore carnivore, they would be like, no way in heck. So what do you think, Greg, is the, if someone came to you and they're asking, what is the first piece of advice I could do to take action towards becoming healthier? So I think the very first thing you have to do is you have to do a this for that swap. Okay. The number one thing that I hear people say, well, I can never give up my Fill in the blank. What is it for you? What have you heard? Oh, I could never give up my ice cream. Okay. Well, I get it. You can't give up your ice cream. It's hard to do. You can, you're just not willing to. There's the thing. It's here. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what your body needs. It's what you want right here. So you have to make the sacrifice. So I say, here's a this for that. I am a huge supporter of Equip Foods Prime Protein Powder. When you take that and you blend it with uh, heavy whipping cream in, I, I've got a Ninja blender. I do two scoops and about 14 ounces of, of heavy whipping cream. And that makes it really thick and really rich. Do it with 16 or 18 ounces. When you do that, now you have ice cream, you have pudding, you have mousse, whatever you want to call it. You have a substitute mm -hmm. for the creamy, cold, sweet dessert. There it is. So equip prime protein, this for that. You want to eat condiments on your food. Okay. Make your own mayonnaise. Don't buy Hellman's. Don't buy Duke's. Although I love Duke's, don't buy that. Make it yourself. Oh, I've got to have a cake. No, stop. <laughs> you don't have to have a cake. Don't do it. Yes, you can have a cake. There's ways to do it. People want to buy Cheez-Its, the little square yellow crackers. I made Cheez-Its the other day. I'm shredded cheese blended with oregano, red pepper flakes, pluck seasoning and put it on a on a piece of parchment paper sprinkle it out so that it's all relatively the same thickness put it in your oven mine goes into an air fryer for 35 minutes at 225 degrees and it bakes into something that i can now portion out and now i've got cheese crackers people that go to the store and they spend six dollars for a two ounce bag of cheese crackers that they all taste the same i don't care if they call them parmesan crisps or swiss or whatever they all taste the same this does too but it costs you a whole lot less to make and you're in control of all the ingredients that go in it i even put bacon in mine i'm eating little pizzas really the oregano and the seasoning it's like eating pizza in a little bitty cracker and it's healthier for me now some people can't handle cheese i get it but you make the this for that swaps. It's okay to eat a hamburger on a roll of lettuce, but eventually drop the lettuce because you don't need it. I mean, you're only using it to keep your fingers from getting greasy. You've eaten a greasy hamburger that melted right through the bun. Mm -hmm. So what's the big deal now? Pick the dang thing up and eat it. Mm -hmm. It all started for me eating cheeseburger salads. So I would have somebody take lettuce and they do shredded lettuce, and then they just put a cheeseburger on top of it, and I put pickles, ketchup, mustard, and, and onions, and there was my my cheeseburger, right? Then I just got rid of the salad because I didn't eat it, because it was just a filler. Yep. Unnecessary. So I think this for that swaps is a good thing for your friends. 
tell people to pay really close attention to the ingredients. Um, if you go too far to all in at once, then it's possible to just fall right off that wagon. And what I mean is you tell somebody, eat carnivore, don't eat sweets, don't drink coffee, exercise, then you're going to start losing people. They're going to be like, oh God, I can't do all that. And then of course you have to stop using secret deodorant. You've got to stop using suave shampoo. You have to start using beef towel. Pretty soon they're going to be like, oh my God, this woman, Lily, this guy, Greg, they're, they're freaks. And they're not going to do one of the items, much less all of the items. So what I say, and I did a video about this, I took a plastic cup and I filled it with a Coca-Cola. And I said, okay, what we want people is we want to dump out the Coca-Cola and fill it with water. So you walk, walk up to your tap and you rinse it out and you fill it up with water. There's your start. That's step one. Step two, you're going to get rid of that water and you're going to put filtered water. In. You're going to get out the heavy metals as much as you can. Step two is a pretty easy step. You just have to buy some equipment that gets you to that point. Step three is that plastic cup it's in, you can do better. You're going to drink that out of glass. Well, I'm not just going to go out and buy glasses because I don't like drinking out of glasses, but you got a coffee mug in your, in your cabinet. Grab a coffee mug, pour the water into a coffee mug. Now you've made the right change. The biggest thing is getting rid of the Coke. That's number one. Get rid of that and don't worry about the microplastics. That's too much information right now. Just worry about getting rid of the Coke. Don't worry about eating just beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Don't worry about just that. Worry about when you go out to eat now, order the steak, no A1. Oh, my God. Anybody that wants to have A1 steak sauce on their steaks that I make, they're fired. Get out. Um, make the little changes. Don't drink the alcohol. That's the biggest change when you go out to eat. Put the alcohol aside. Drink water straight water ask the server before you order do you charge for club soda we went out to eat one night they charged five dollars a glass for club soda coca-cola 3.99 i wrote a letter to that company and said y'all are doing it wrong so start weaning yourself off of that stuff that's the easiest way to do it if you ask somebody to go all in good luck they're not going to stay all in forever baby steps i call it the remove and replace method so it's same thing like if you're not just losing something, you're gaining something as well. So if you're going to stop having the pizza, what do you get to have instead? Because there's ways to make a pizza that's healthy. And even my husband, he does the same thing with the equip where he says, I'm always having dessert. I'm having dessert every day because I'm making this protein shake in my milk and it's delicious. And I don't need to eat dessert when I've got this other option. You can find Greg on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at The RV Carnivore. And while you're at it, don't be silly. Subscribe to Lily, and I'll see you in the next one.